Hey everyone, welcome to the YouTube live stream, uh, the podcast, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll kick it off. Everyone out there in the audience, thanks for being here. Fantastic to have you. Please ask questions and participate if you, if you feel like it. Pradyan, Paul, Chris H, and Chris S, <laughs> welcome to Talk Python to Me. It's great to have you all here. Good to be here. Thanks for doing this, Michael. Nice to be here. Yeah, Thank you. yeah absolutely. Um, happy to be doing it. I think talking about documentation and all the, the static site stuff and book generation stuff that we're going to talk about is going to be super fun. And you all are at the center of various fulcrums of that <laughs> throughout the ecosystem. So it's great to have you here. Great to be talking about that stuff. So let's just start really quick with a, a quick introduction and then uh, what you're up to these days. You know, Paul, you're a regular here, so you want to go first? Sure. Uh, I'm Paul Everett. I'm a JetBrains developer advocate. Uh, big fan of the show. <laughs> uh, big fan, total fanboy of the other three people here. I've got all kinds of stories about where I was when I found out about Mist and the parser and and uh, desperately wishing I could join Pradyan and all the things that he's doing. And I will add a um, big, big fan of Carol Willing. And when I grew up, I want to be Carol Willing. <laughs> Fantastic. And you're still at JetBrains? Still at JetBrains, yep. Right on, keeping the pie charm yep. flowing. Right on. Pradyan, how about you? Uh, I work at Bloomberg, although now what I'm going to talk about today is related to work. Uh, Software engineer there, work on the Python infrastructure team. I am a maintainer on PIP. Uh, I have written a Sphinx team or two, depending on how you count the second one. And I'm involved in a bunch of sort of various efforts around Sphinx at this point. I've sort of made myself comfortable in these spaces and sort of made my way into the various discussion forums, I guess. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, with me, I guess, in this topic. Awesome. You well, seem welcome. to be the emergency maintainer of many open source projects, like Live Reload. <laughs> yeah, the the I have a mild issue of not knowing when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right, Chris H. Yeah, so my name is Chris Holgraf. Um, I'm the director of the International Interactive Computing Collaboration, or 2I2C. Uh, which is a nonprofit that runs cloud infrastructure for interactive computing and the Jupyter ecosystem and the sort of surrounding ecosystem uh, alongside of it for research and education communities. Um, my background is largely in the Jupyter ecosystem. I've worked a lot on Jupyter Hub, which serves multiple Jupyter sessions via some kind of centralized cloud infrastructure. Um, I also work a lot on the Binder project, which focuses on mm -hmm more like scientific reproducibility and, and shareable computing environments in a kind of like cloud agnostic um, and pretty flexible manner. Yeah, it's and fantastic. So for people who don't know do... about Binder, that's basically if you are on a, like a GitHub repo or some published notebook that's not interactive, you can click that and it'll fire up a little environment where you can go and explore the notebook for real, right? Yep, yeah, exactly. And so a lot of these things are kind of, surrounding this uh, general topic of like scientific communication, scientific reproducibility, um, bringing those kind of like data workflows and, and facilitating them with uh, software development, which is yeah. related to a lot of the stuff we're talking about today as well. Yeah, fantastic. You also have worked on the MIST project, right? Yes, yeah, and one of the one of the projects that I'm focusing on right now, along with uh, Chris S and a few other collaborators is called the Executable Books Project. And this is basically an attempt at uh, improving the state of open source kind of community driven tools in the Python ecosystem around scientific communication um, and building a lot on top of the Sphinx ecosystem because there's a lot of uh, good material there to work with and a lot of improvements that can be made that'll benefit the broader Python community as well. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Looking forward to talking about Jupyter Book as well. That'll be fun. Chris, see well, you're back. Tell us about yourself. Hi, yes. Sorry, I. <laughs> was hearing double of everything <laughs> and I was like, what the heck is going on? And then I realized I had the YouTube tab open oh, as geez, well yes. in the background. So I was you hearing- You are your own audience then, member. Yes, this is not a good feeling. Yeah, exactly. I was like, what is going on here? Okay, anyway, <laughs> that's that trouble over. 
So, um, yeah, so I work in the executive books. Um, I guess, essentially, my kind of uh, focus is on providing, uh, making the best tools for scientists to make uh, open, reproducible science. So I work 50% uh, of the time uh, here in Switzerland at EPFL on um, a package called AIDA, which is a Python uh, workflow engine um, for running uh, simulations, orchestration simulations. And then I work the other 50% of the time in, in executable books on uh, MIST and JupyterBook. Yeah. Oh, that's really fantastic. Is any of your work in, in Switzerland, does it have to do with CERN or other projects? Um, no, not to do with CERN. It's uh, EPFL um, in a group uh, on um, materials discovery. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, quick uh, pause. Um, your mic, it, it's Bluetooth, right? It sounds like it's getting a lot of interference. Could you just like turn turn the Bluetooth off and turn it back on and then just we'll, we'll keep going? I think that, that okay, will probably, yeah. that'll probably clear it up. All right. Well, let's let's start by talking about um, Sphinx. I think so. When I think about Sphinx, I think about Python documentation. So, uh, who wants to sort of set the stage for Sphinx? I mean, I guess it does say the Python document documentation generator, but it does more than that as well. If if you wanted to, right? So. Guys, what is Sphinx? Where, when do I use this? What, what's its value? It's been around for a long time. I know Let's that. do a round table. I'd love to hear everyone's elevator pitch. Yeah, exactly. What's the elevator pitch for Sphinx? I mean, I can, I can start with sort of how I got into Sphinx and then maybe how I use Sphinx now, which is a little bit different yeah. from how I initially used it. I think that a lot of people, so Sphinx has been around for a really long time um, and it's a really powerful tool for documentation. And a lot of people use it alongside of their software projects that they work on. So my first introduction to Sphinx was via, uh, it was actually a neuroscience analytics package called MNE Python. And we needed documentation to describe, you know, the APIs and the functions and the classes and things like use cases and examples. And so one of the really useful things about Sphinx is that it has an inherent extensibility and a lot of flexibility so that you can both generate like narrative documentation with it, but also include programmatically generated documentation, API documentation, and that kind of thing. Um, so it, it lets you kind of like more seamlessly merge together uh, code documentation or documentation embedded within code and your more kind of traditional narrative examples, tutorials, that kind of a thing. I see, almost um, like a, a, a wiki plus an API documentation generator. In, in one. Yeah, plus that's been around for a long time and with an inherent ex extensibility. So a lot of different sub communities have kind of built out their own um, community specific documentation uh, that, that builds on top of the kind of basic Sphinx building blocks. Sure. I and bet then, the scientific uh, community has got a lot of specializations. They're like, we need to be able to express stuff like this, right? Well, so that, that kind of got, gets me to the second part of what I was going to describe, which is I think over time, and this is one of the inspirations behind Jupyter book to some degree is the realization that like technical and API documentation is also really useful or, well, I should say the things you need to build for really good technical and API documentation are really useful for other kinds of use cases as well. And so um, I saw some other groups uh, in the scientific ecosystem. There's a really interesting one called Simpeg, which I think is just S I M P E G dot X Y Z. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Uh -huh. And they basically built out a whole geospatial analytics um, tutorial and sort of documentation um, resource just built on Sphinx. And so for me, seeing that, uh, it kind of unlocked a, a, an aha moment in my head to realize that you could also use the same documentation engine for documenting lots of other things, not just you know software packages and, and things like that. Um, technical documentation is quite generic and overlaps quite a lot with like scientific documentation and, and scholarly documentation. And so that's the space that we've been exploring over the last uh, couple of months and years. Yeah, fantastic. And a lot of the outputs are, are super flexible. It outputs HTML, which you might host on somewhere like Read the Docs or Netlify, but also LaTeX, which is really important for publications and EPUB for um, uh, ebooks and, and whatnot. So pretty cool. Chris, what's your elevator pitch? Chris S. Sorry, got to keep the disambiguating uh, yeah. you all. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, just to confuse things. But um, yeah, I think. Hey, hey Chris, I'm sorry, but your someone. your um your audio has gotten a lot worse. Is there maybe maybe Let try me, to cycle yeah, yeah. or, or something? And um, I'll I'll, I'll ask Predian, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, sure. 
Uh, elevator pitch, I guess, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> hmm. I think Sphinx is documentation generator written in Python, primarily intended for technical documentation with the ability to sort of intertwine narrative documentation with auto-generated documentation that picks up things from your code. Right. right? And this whole thing is combined with the ability to have a variety of output formats as well as a variety of extension points within the tooling to extend basically every aspect of building that documentation. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So for example, testing the code snippets that you might have in your documentation yes. or uh, doc strings or something like that, maybe. Yep. So that is doc test and that's baked into Sphinx and Python's documentation, which happens to also be written in Sphinx. Okay. Or Interesting. By Sphinx. So yeah. yeah, there's, there's a lot of, whoop, <laughs> there's a lot of this, uh, there's a lot of capability and power hidden underneath the shell of Sphinx. And as Chris was mentioning, there's really extensive customizability here yeah. that you can then take and specialize it to your specific use cases. And that sort of both the power and, you know, there's a con to that, which is, hey, you got to maintain this and you got to uh, keep this functioning and stuff. But yeah, uh, it's. It's a really powerful documentation generation tool that is perhaps a little too powerful for its own good. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Yeah, so uh, docs.python.org is generated by Sphinx, huh? Yes. Fantastic. All right, Chris, see well, let's <laughs> come oh, back to you. Sorry about that. How does it sound oh, now? Any better? Oh, you're fantastic. Yeah, you're great. Okay, I ditched the uh, headphones. Um, yeah, I, I think the other point that I wanted to touch on this is in one of the brilliant points there on the Sphinx site is the cross-referencing um, capability yes. is just second to none. You know, you can you can reference in a page, you can reference cross-page within your own documentation, but also um, and one of the things that's really helped to build on Sphinx is re the read the docs community and the work they're doing so that you can reference any other site that's built on read the docs as well um in uh, yeah in a, in a really nice way um yeah that's something that really surprised me when i learned about sphinx is you know give a quick shout out to paul paul wrote a course that uh we hosted over on talk python generating static sites with sphinx and markdown which is really really cool and one of the things that surprised me is when i think about creating multiple pages. So for example, if I'm on GitHub and I want to have this this part of a, some readme here point to some other readme or some other markdown, I just go in there and I type, you know, here's the relative path over to that thing and I come up with the text that goes there. Sphinx allows you to have kind of an index into all the sub elements of the page, not just the pages, but like parts of the pages, you know, headers and, and whatnot. And you can link to them by name right and so if for some reason you change the title of a header your a tag text that you are linking to will change which is pretty awesome right exactly yeah yeah and also inter sphinx right which is a way to expose those endpoint not those endpoints those those index points across domain or across project right so i could reference to something on python in my documentation specifically by a, a reference point, not by a URL, which is pretty excellent. And I think that's a big part of why Sphinx is as adopted as it is, of like the fact that Sphinx exists and the fact that you can very easily cross-reference bits in other parts of the ecosystem, as mm -hmm. long as that part of the ecosystem is in Sphinx, uh, yeah. or at least has the Sphinx file generated, right? Like in theory, other ecosystems could or other tooling could generate it as well. But yeah, I think that is quite capable if the fact that it's in restructured text has uh, <laughs> some <laughs> fun interactions with all the linking syntaxes that exist, but mm -hmm. it is genuinely very powerful, as I said, so. Yeah, so let's talk about that for a little bit because when I thought about Sphinx originally, 
I always thought about restructured text. And restructured text is, it's, it's kind of funky. I don't know. I, I just have a hard time getting used to it. But, um, you know, it uh, all those those formats and whatnot, it, it takes some getting used to, right? You've got, uh, let me see if I can find an example we can pull up here. You know, things like dot, dot, image, colon, colon, some other thing. And then, you know, sort of almost like a YAML style. And to me, when I'm writing, I feel like, wow, I would just much rather write Markdown and just blaze through this and write it nice and clean. And I'm willing to give up a, a little formatting or, or something to allow me to live in a simpler world that doesn't require so much stuff. So um, traditionally, restructured text have been, has been the way of the documentation through Sphinx. It's also been like the way that you put your information on PyPI and describe it there, right? But the PyPI.org version moved over to at least support Markdown. And through some of the work you all are doing, Sphinx now has um, an integration layer with doing everything in Markdown as well, right? You want to talk about that maybe? Yeah, I think so. As President, uh, President mentioned, um, Sphinx is just incredibly powerful, but it's trying to <laughs> harness that power and make it not overwhelming to kind of non-technical users. For people who want it, it's brilliant and you can do everything mm -hmm. under the sun, but trying to um, sell it to the masses, as it were, and <laughs> trying to make it as easy to use as possible for simple use cases, but then having that extensibility there um, is, I guess, kind of what we've been looking at in the executive books. Um, and with this, um, with the markdown, most everyone now knows about Markdown, uh, Common Mark, how to Right, write. we've got GitHub and uh, Stack Overflow have basically forced the software development community to understand it, right? <laughs> exactly, for uh, whether people love it or hate it, it's there and you know it. So being able to just, just even copy and paste things from your, your GitHub or, or Stack Overflow or just write something um, that's quite intuitive to write. That's uh, what we're really trying to be trying to get at, um, trying to hide almost some of the intricacies of Sphinx, um, mm -hmm. make it more user friendly on the front end. Okay, great. What do you guys got to add to this uh, restructured text markdown duality here? I think it's an interesting duality and I missed my, I don't know how to say this. <laughs> I, I find this, uh, when I first discovered this, I was really fascinated because I was like, hey, this, this looks cool. This looks like a really good, I found it especially amusing to see how missed, let's pick one phrasing, um, yep, presentation, yep. I guess. Uh, I really liked how Mist ends up con reconciling the complexity or power, depending on how you look at it, yep. of Sphinx and sort of fitting that into Markdown and not, and having it still look like it belongs there, right? Because there's a whole bunch of, well, directives, roles, or whatever you want to call them uh, that well, you can use to manipulate the text and include things and have those extensible points. And right, because Markdown is not nearly sophisticated enough to handle things like interest Sphinx and these other types of um, constructs that's in Sphinx, right? Yes. So, like, one example of this would be the ability to have the cards that you're showing on the screen at the moment, right? Like, the closest thing you can do uh, with, for that in Markdown would probably be embed a bunch of HTML. Uh, yeah, yeah, that or tables when you get basically no styling there, like it, yeah. it's not cards, it's all jammed together in a table, but yeah. Yeah, and even when you have the ability to have inline sort of markup of markup that's in the same line as the paragraph that you're writing in, you have a very limited set of those, right? Like bold, italics, underlines, maybe strikes if the platform you're using supports it uh, and stuff like that. But with missed or restructured text or whatever, you have a lot more capability there. Yeah. You in part to Sphinx, you in part to DocuDills, which is what implements the restructured text format. Right 
default. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Markup format, ah, markup language. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah. On this particular point of the power expressing itself into Markdown, I've enjoyed watching Chris and Chris over the years iterate through mm -hmm. this, um, roll some things out, realize, wait, you know, it's better in tooling if we do a triple colon instead of a triple back tick because the body of the directive can then be rendered by some inline viewer or something. So I'd be interested in hearing Chris and Chris talk a little bit about your like voyage of discovery for, you know, what's the gestalt of Markdown? So, yeah, it's interesting. So uh, obviously we're, we're with, with Jupyterbook and things, we're very much focused on, you know, in, in these, in Jupyter notebooks, you have the markdown cells, everything is written in markdown. And that historically has a single kind of renderer that renders things. Um, so trying to harness the simplicity of markdown and trying to make it look nice <laughs> as you're writing um, with, and it doesn't look like a complete mess uh, within the, these markdown cells. Uh, whilst still having the, the capabilities of like a restructured text um, has been an interesting challenge. So obviously we had this, we, we wanted to make the marked, the missed format kind of degradable to common mark so that it can be passed normally as with a normal uh, markdown parser, although it wouldn't know what to do with things like notes. And, um, and all of the other these other directives and roles that you that you can have within um, Sphinx, um, but at the same time, yeah, have all the capabilities. So it's it's a hard balancing act, I'd say, <laughs> of trying to to uh, just say here's here's all of these roles and directives. And sure, you don't want to spoil the simplicity of Markdown, though, right? It's it, yeah, it's yeah, exactly. It's having the readability of the source text essentially, um, weighing that against the flexibility of actually making, you know, these lovely HTML pages. Right, exactly. Chris H., you want to add something to that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think that the interesting thing about Markdown, and probably something that, that we should clarify for some of the people here, is that there is no one Markdown. Yes, like, that surprised me. I didn't realize it. that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's like, you can you know Markdown when you see it, but there is no like canonical markdown. The closest thing to a standard that exists is common mark markdown, which is like an attempt at standardization across a few different communities. But over the years, what we've seen, whether it's you know Stack Overflow or GitHub or whatever, basically people want to extend common mark in a couple of ways. So they add in a new couple of syntax uh, features to support, and they have then created a new flavor of markdown. So people often talk about markdown in terms of flavors, like what you know, what uh, functionality do you want to turn on? What functionality do you want to turn off? And there are a couple of nice like uh, renderers and parsers in, for example, the JavaScript world that will let you, you know, enable extensions in Markdown to turn on and off different kinds of syntax. And so what's interesting about Mist is that it's kind of intentionally trying to create like a privileged extension point, yeah. either for block level uh, writing or for inline writing. Uh, in part with the goal that you don't have to create a new flavor of Markdown if you want to extend Markdown's functionality in a new direction. And I think it's going to create an interesting question of, okay, you've created a new extension point, but you want to have some kind of um, reliability or knowledge that your document's going to behave the same in one implementation of a missed render or a missed parser versus another implementation. So there's an extra sort of interesting standards question of, okay, if a directive is infinitely extensible, right? It's basically like a, a Python function, but in Markdown, mm -hmm. is there some like minimal subset of directives that you want to support as a part of core mist? So that if it's a missed parser for Sphinx or a missed parser for you know, an HTML website or for some other documentation engine, right. that you know that they'll behave similarly. That, that is a big challenge. Uh, a quick question from the audience. Uh, Ryan asked, does GitHub use their own version or do they use common mark? They use GitHub flavored markdown, GFM. <laughs> um, which is a superset of common mark? 
Yes. It is indeed, yes. It's got, it, it now has, um, I mean, if you, I think if you, you can Google it, I guess, GitHub for Open Markdown. It has its own specification, um, which is built on top of common, the common mark specification. And oh, it's about, that it's different as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it adds a few extensions, a few slightly different things, but like tables. Right. Exactly. Funnily enough, it's, it's not in common mark, which is quite a, a basic thing, but that is not in common mark. That's only in GitHub flavored markdown. Yeah. Yeah, common mark was avoiding the politics of what it got took to get it to where it got. Uh, there was a decent amount of oh, this has to be maximally compliant. Like, mm -hmm. this has to be the thing that yeah. works everywhere. A right? minimum functionality, the maximum reach sort of story, right? Yeah, and they sort of went, okay, what works basically everywhere? And that's sort of what ended up becoming common mark. So any effort to like, oh, how about we extend this has sort of not gone very well so far. <laughs> sure. So I, I do want to give a quick shout out to this app I came across recently called Typora for writing Markdown. And one of the things I think is interesting, the reason I'm bringing it up is it has the standard Markdown stuff, but it also has like inline bits for like mathematics and other stuff like diagrams and, and whatnot. And, and this is the kind of stuff you're talking about, Chris, right? Where you want to take the core, but there's ways to extend it in yeah. MIST, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of Python, right? Or a lot of languages where you can define functions is that you can you can show a lot more creativity and add extra functionality in a very intentional, structured way, right? So that it's easier for you to replicate other people's work and build on top of it and, and things like that. And so in some ways, that's how I think about directives and roles is it's like bringing functions, but into a realm where you're dealing with like human written text. Um, yeah. Or code that is like interpreted, but inside of you know these little directives and things like that, which just opens up a lot of extra room for creativity and, and trying out different kinds of things. I guess because we're gonna mention this a bunch um, in sort of Sphinx glossary or terminology, directives are essentially a block of text that you're all saying. It also has this characteristic associated with it, like. Hey, present this in like a note box or whatever. Whereas a right. role would probably be something in line like, hey, make this bold or uh, hey, this is actually a link to another thing and stuff like that. In case folks who are listening aren't familiar, this would probably be helpful. Although I wish we had said this sooner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you're absolutely. coming from the front end world, I'm a kind of a refugee from um, Gatsby. Mm hmm in which Markdown is almost like a database format, a um, lot of structure. But when it comes to Markdown and extension points and things like that, oh my God, the monkey business they jump through to try and get information from the document to the extension point or whatever. And they all have to invent their own little mechanism for packing stuff into the space after the code fence invocation. Mm -hmm. It's just clearly obvious that they need something like what MIST has done, which is a consistent syntax that just hands things over to restructured text directives. Right, yeah, I, yeah, think, I mean, that's, think Yeah, go ahead. But I was just going to say, like, I think that the... I think what's interesting about you know Sphinx and DocuTils is that intermediate document model that exists, which I think is is something that differentiates it from a lot of other like markdown parsers and renderers that are out there. I think a lot of the like a lot of static website generators, they're effectively going from blobs of markdown mapped onto blobs of HTML as a sort of like heuristic, like it's a very programmatic output kind of a thing. And, and actually the original version of Jupyter book, maybe like two and a half years old now, it was a wrapper around Jekyll, the Jekyll website generator. But because Jekyll was fundamentally just doing, you know, blobs of, of markdown to blobs of HTML, there wasn't that intermediate rich document representation where you can do things like resolve cross references and collect, you know, bibliographic entries and collect, you know, equation and, and figure labels so that you can refer to them elsewhere. Um, 
and once you add that extra model in, it gives you a lot of extra. I think that's where a lot of that extra like uh, power and complexity comes from in the Sphinx ecosystem. And so, in some yeah. ways, Markdown, Mist Markdown, is just like a. It's almost like a, a front end on a user side. It's just giving you, at least in my opinion, a more user friendly um, entry point into the Sphinx ecosystem. Yeah, most times you just want to write straight Markdown, but every now and then you need something like one of these references over to another part of the site or you need more control. And so Mist has this ability to say, kind of like run some inline restructured text here, right? That as well as the ability to just hook into the thing that restructured text would, right? So that would be the directive. So you can embed restructured text in line but that's usually not what you need to do or want to do. Uh, usually you're just able to directly use the thing that you wanted to use. So yeah, there you go. Okay, so you would go and hook you, in and, and write some Python code to process one of these directives. That's pretty excellent. Yeah, and a bunch of these directives exist already in, well, Sphinx, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can just reuse them as you would in restructured text in MIST, except with a slightly different syntax because you're operating in a different markup language now. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So, so, um, yeah, sorry. So it's, uh, um, the terminology they use is interpreted text. So it's just a block of text and here's the name of the class function that is going to interpret this. And here's some may, uh, maybe some options to help it interpret it. And then it can do what it wants with it. Nice. So does MIST come with a bunch of these uh, extensions already that you can use like for maybe, maybe like scientific graphs or, or things like that that you can pull in? Or uh, where, where do I find more of these if I don't want to write them myself? So one of the goals of the Jupyter book project is trying to bring in functionality from the Jupyter ecosystem around interactive computational document models mm -hmm. um, like IPy and the Jupyter Notebook files and also kernels that can run arbitrary, you know, usually data centric code for visualizations and analysis and things like that, where those code will generate outputs like, you know, PNG images or HTML, you know, interactive visualizations or, you know, tables with statistical analyses in them and, and that sort of stuff. And so one of the goals of the executable books project is also to build sort of entry points for the Jupyter ecosystem into Sphinx and into Mist Markdown. So you can kind of get the like complexity of the Pi data ecosystem or the R ecosystem or the Julia ecosystem, um, but with the ability to embed that into, you know, a documentation narrative structure as well. So I think that that's where a lot of the scientific use cases come from is like using scientific code that gets executed alongside of your documentation build in a programmatic fashion and where those outputs of the code are then inserted into your document in a way that from a reader's perspective looks like it's just part of the you know narrative flow of everything else that was there. Right, that's fantastic. So maybe tell people a bit about the a Jupyter book project itself. Uh, it's an open source project for building beautiful publication quality books and documentation, as you said, from sort of taking the code in the notebook and generating the output, uh, like some of the graphs and whatnot uh, in a, a live way. But it sounds fascinating. Uh, maybe when would I use it? Tell people a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the simplest, I mean, from a technical standpoint, since we're kind of riffing off of Sphinx, hmm. uh, Jupyter Book is a distribution of Sphinx. It's basically a collection of pre-configured Sphinx extensions, some of which are developed by the executable books team and community, others of which have been developed by the broader Sphinx community and that are just reused and, and contributed upstream to by, by people in executive books. And those extensions have been chosen to sort of all feed into this use case of, of scientific and technical documentation. So things like um, Sphinx Contrib BibTeX is uh, a bibliography and, and citation extension in Sphinx, and that's activated automatically with Jupyter Book. Um, right on. Because of course you're going to need that. And you want something like Evernote that's going to pull from some source that's always like, I always quote this article or something, right? Yeah. I mean, just, you know, that it's like a, 
it's a use case that's not built into core Sphinx, like having references and citations and bibliographies. And yeah. so it, it, it pulls that uh, that workflow into Sphinx via an extension. Nice. Um, so Jupyter Book is kind of a collection of these extensions and then wrapped in a command line interface and a configuration structure that's a little bit more user friendly. I think that's one of the things about Sphinx is that at least historically, it has tended to be both developed by and catered to the developer community, which is a little bit different from the scientific community. A lot of scientists know just enough code to be dangerous with, <laughs> myself included. Yeah. And are often, you know, not as familiar with traditional software development workflows. And so things like, you know, Jupyter Book is configurable with a YAML file rather than with a, in Sphinx, the default configuration is with oh, a conf.py file, so right, right, right. file directly. So a little quality of life improvements to make it a little bit easier for people to get started with this more opinionated uh, distribution of, of Sphinx. Yeah, it sounds like a pen. Yeah, what a fascinating resource for people. And I'm an EndNote, not Evernote. Sorry, <laughs> that's the 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 one you use for references. Uh, I there's some good questions in the audience. I want to ask you all, but before we do, uh, I want to ask about Mist just a little bit more. So Mist looks really interesting, and it looks like it allows me to do much more, many more powerful things with Markdown than just straight Markdown. Right now, for when I'm in my code, like say on the website, it might have to take some markdown content and turn it into a page or something. I'm just using something like markdown two or one of the rent arbitrary just markdown parsers. Does this make sense as something to run sort of live in your application rather than a, a publication generation story? Like, would it make sense to replace just using that that one function from that library and then allow me to write like directives that do more for the site, for example? I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Well, I think what Michael wants is the layer under mist. <laughs> yeah, probably. There is, there is a parser inspired by, I guess, the JavaScript parser written by Chris and Chris. It was actually the way I found Mist when I was looking at Mistune and Mistletoe. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there's a wonderful uh, parser that lets you hand it strings and you get back Markdown. Yeah. So you hand it Markdown and you get HTML, you mean? Sorry, yeah. Hand, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's what I want. Yeah, 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 exactly. What I want is a nice way to have richer Markdown like yep. in, in an application, in production not just as you know something that I run like a build process against. So there's a bunch of, I guess, parsers for Mist. Um, there's an implementation in Python. There's an implementation in JavaScript. If yeah, work in yeah, progress. Yeah. Nothing, so I take that as a yes. Uh, so yeah, uh, there's, there's multiple implementations of that. And you can integrate that into an application if you wanted to. Um, so I think this is where we're working on this kind of missed specification of what what would be core missed, as in what can we pass not just in Sphinx but with other kinds of parsers and, and you say embedded into applications. So one of the things we've been working on, say, is this JavaScript application um, for MIST. And, and uh, well, one of the nice things, firstly, about how we pass how we use Mist with Sphinx in the Python world is that it uses um, Markdown at Pi, which is a Python implementation of Markdown it, which is a JavaScript um, application, is a JavaScript package for passing Markdown. So we use so on both sides in Python and in JavaScript, we can use exactly the same, essentially exactly the same code, and pass it exactly the same. Um, so then we're working on this Markdown it docutils in JavaScript um, to see if we can bring as much of the functionality, um, probably not all of the functionality of, of Sphinx into also the JavaScript world, um, where obviously that's what you need if you want to be able to do anything kind of live without a back end. Or right, runtime, yeah. OK, uh, exciting to hear you all are working on it. All right, uh, let's bring this maybe back to the documentation side. Ryan, now the audience asks, uh, could we describe the whole process that a missed document goes through before it becomes an HTML document? Like sort of what, what happens to my, my inputs to get either the HTML or the EPUB or whatever I get? 
Okay, so um, essentially, so you have your markdown text file. Um, markdown, uh, we then pass it, as I just mentioned, with, with markdown at Pi, which turns it into a bunch of syntax tokens. Um, and then we take them tokens and we convert them into the docutils asked um, uh, syntax tree, which is mm -hmm. what Sphinx works with. So, uh, and then when, as we're converting that into the docutils asked, um, the Sphinx works with, uh, the, we, we're running all of these directives and these roles, this interpreted text against all of the, the functions, the extensions within the, that have been loaded within Sphinx. And we end up with this, uh, this nice uh, syntax tree uh, Python thing with nodes and, bit, um, and then we say to Sphinx, there you go, <laughs> take it away. Um, right. and, and traditionally, uh, Sphinx has gone through some sort of mar uh, restructured text process to generate that. And you're like, we're going to generate that and give it to you in a different way. Now just do what you do to generate your documentation, right? Exactly. So once you've passed it through this mist, or you've done research the text, you end up with exactly the same thing. This, this uh, syntax tree with nodes, and then Sphinx can go for that, and that's a kind of agnostic to any kind of um, output format. That's yeah. just here, here's a, a, a paragraph, and then within that, here's some text, and here's a bit of bold and a bit of uh, bit italic. Right, right, right. Cool. And which, looping this back around to what we mentioned at the start of like the power of Sphinx, right? Of the extensibility of it is that the markup format that you're writing with is decoupled from anything else that you do with it. Not the extensions, not the directives that you use, none of that. They're all sort of a separate step from that. And that getting that separation happens through the intermediate document tree or doc tree, which if anyone's worked with Sphinx has probably seen uh, mentions of in the build directory and stuff. So yeah, the doc tree sort of acts as that separator. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah. and so you go from your, sorry, yeah, you go from your input text to your doc tree, then to your output for formats, HTML, right. latex, et cetera. And on the way, you can me you mess around with all the doc tree to, yeah. to make sure you've got a, uh, written to document references and all this kind of thing. Right. Little known fact, if you go to SourceForge, and look at docutils, you'll see that they, from the very beginning, have anticipated restructured text not being the only format. Restructured text is just one. It happens to be the default parser, but it wasn't intended to be the only parser. Yeah, wow. Well. A lot of what we've been discussing is things that Sphinx does. Uh, Sphinx, for sort of the most part, is really a good wrapper around a lot of what Docutils provides. It's a much more friendly package, in my opinion, to interact with. Um, and generally, similar to sort of how, uh, in some senses, JupyterBook sort of wraps Sphinx into a nicer package to use. Sphinx does that for Docutils, right? And it builds upon it to gives you give you additional functionality. It, gives you additional points to hook into in the build process that you would still have with docutils. Like it's clearly not doing anything addition to like in the build process in addition to what docutils would. It just gives you a better framework to do that. Um, and a lot of what we've been talking about of like that intermediate format and stuff, those are all concepts coming up from docutils into Sphinx. Yeah, very, very interesting. Alvaro out there asks, uh, can we use the AST to translate between markup languages, something like Pandoc, which is a, a pretty neat thing. It sounds like that might already work. You've got the different output formats and stuff already, right? Yeah, so an interesting example of this actually is um, there's a, a little helper tool that Chris wrote uh, as a part of the Executable Books project called RST to Mist. And essentially, it's a converter. If you have a bunch of documentation written in restructured text, 
and you want to automatically convert it into missed markdown. Because missed markdown and restructured text have the same like fundamental vocabulary, they just have different syntaxes that map onto that uh, you know, docutils doc tree. Um, you can go from one to the other relatively easily. And that's what the RST to missed package does is that, you know, it parses RST into these abstract tokens, and then it can render those tokens as uh, missed markdown um, rather than restructured text. And that's because of that sort of intermediate document format that's there. That's I think what Pandoc exactly. has is like this huge library of rules, basically, of how do you go from these abstract tokens into like a billion different output formats. Um, and that sort of speaks to the the community of the Pandoc world that's been around for quite a long time and is doing a lot of really awesome work there too. Yeah, indeed. All right, let's bring it back to Sphinx a little bit. Uh, I know uh, you all wanted to give a, a quick shout out to uh, Juan about uh, some of the tutorials that he created, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, go ahead. Sure, I guess I'll do it. So one of the things that Sphinx, as we've been talking about, has in it has a documentation site, right? And it is a documentation generator, but it didn't have a tutorial uh, <laughs> to get you started. So that's yeah. one of the things that Juan worked on recently. Uh, and I think a bunch of that work is actually piggybacking off of Read the Docs getting funding from CZI, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, as an essential open source software. I think it's under the EOSS program, but I could be wrong on that. Um, and yeah, uh, he worked on a tutorial for Sphinx that, well, introduces people to Sphinx essentially and, well, tells you what your first steps to document your project using Sphinx would be. Yeah, very cool. It sounds uh, certainly useful to have, right? Like. The API documentation is, is not enough to make it uh, feel really great. All right, so the next thing I want to talk a bit about with Sphinx is sort of the the look and feel side of things, right? <laughs> can so, I can I really quickly make a plug? Actually, yeah, yeah, absolutely, go for it. Um, I think that one of the other reasons that um, like Juan, for example, has been contributing some of this improvements to the Sphinx documentation is that like Sphinx is pretty old in, in mm -hmm. computer science world and technology mm -hmm. world. It's like an ancient technology, you know, it's like eight years old or something like that. Um, I and know. I think that one of more than that, one of DocuTools yeah. at least. Yeah, that's true. That's like the, the early, early days of Python. So anyway, my, my point is that I think that um, the documentation about Sphinx has been around for a long time. But I think that the community's understanding of like what makes for good documentation has evolved quite a lot in the last like 15 years. Hmm. Um, there's just more expectations around different kinds of documentation that you expect to find embedded in one place. Uh, I put a link in the YouTube comments for a really interesting framework that's been gaining some traction lately called the diataxis framework. But this idea that you sort of cleanly separate out like tutorials and how-to examples and reference documentation and explanations, that's just one example. But I think that like there's, there's the community is sort of evolved and made more complex its own idea of what makes for good documentation in some ways faster than a lot of these um, Python packages that have been around for like decades in some cases have kept up with that pace. And so I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit to improve a lot of these aspects um, by making contributions to Sphinx stocks and other pieces in the ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. If I can make an addition to your addition. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I think of Sphinx as is I think of it as a miracle. It's an underappreciated miracle. They crank out bug fix updates with long lists of features and bugs fixed and all over and over for year after year. They don't get to go do Greenfield development. They're still stuck in Python 2.3 land or something like that. <laughs> They've got this main template, which was written back when Mark Andreessen was still in grad school. Um, it's, it's just heroic what they do. Yeah, it's amazing when software continues to live like that, right? Yeah. It, it's foundational software sure. uh, to the ecosystem. And yeah, uh, there's very little uh, greenfield development there. And there's very little sort of exciting work that sort of, it's all complicated problems with lots of complexity to deal with. 
yeah. both in terms of compatibility as yeah. well. Oh, not having enough visibility into how your users are using things to know for sure if a change will break them. Yeah. So basically everything is a breaking change. Let's operate with that <laughs> and the constraints that that brings with it. So yeah, yeah, that's that's a big constraint for sure. Wow. Cool. All right. So let's talk about uh, look and feel. So there's the whole idea of S Sphinx themes, right? How yeah. And uh, maintained by some people we know here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is indeed my user. Adrian, you want to give a you want to give a quick shout out to the themes and tell us a bit about it. Sure. So one of the things that Sphinx has, as we've mentioned multiple times, is a bunch of variety of outputs, right? And even within those, even within the HTML output format, you have the ability to change how your output stylized, right? What theme you end up using. Uh, this is roughly analogous to, I guess, Jekyll themes or Hugo themes, in that you give it a bunch of templates, maybe a bit of logic, depending on what you're doing. And yeah, it renders. Uh, Sphinx has that. Uh, and what's probably on screen at the moment, as we've talked, about this is sphinxthemes.org, which is one of the sites I helped update uh, to be more pretty and more up to date and sort of a more curated set of, well, themes for Sphinx uh, that you can and maybe should be using uh, yeah. when you move away from the defaults, essentially. Um, as Chris mentioned, Sphinx is fairly old and when you look at the themes that ship with it, they bear that aesthetic with them. Uh, they don't look like they were built last week by someone <laughs> who <laughs> has been doing this since not too long. So oh. yeah, Wayback Machine would be a if good- If you ever go to the Wayback Machine and you look at something that is a, you know, a popular website from from the early days, you know- it, Yeah, I think 2004 ish I don't know, yeah. It's an amazing experience to just like pull up Google or Yahoo. I mean, yeah. To, to look at something like this and say, yeah, that's one of the biggest companies in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it will kind of uh, reframe your opinion. But having these themes, I think, is an important, uh, important aspect. I do think having them look really good is something that, you know, is. These are starting to come along, right? Like I think the furrow theme and the book theme look really nice. There's the Pi Data theme. If you've done Read the Docs, right? Read the Docs is one of the themes that people I'm sure are familiar with. I think for a very long time, the only major good theme, or one of the two major good themes was the Read the Docs theme. Yep. The other yep. one being Alabaster, which is yep. not the default. Alabaster is not the default. Um, and I think it's been fairly recent that these new themes have sort of come in and gained major adoption in sort of the timeline of Sphinx, I would say. Uh, and I think that's a good thing because, well, I am personally motivated to do a lot of this, right? Yeah. I have been, like one of the themes you mentioned is one that I wrote from scratch. And, uh, it's it's been an interestingly fun experience, and I can see why there's not a lot of these. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tricky, huh? It is. Tricky. I, I really would like to give you credit for this. I think Furo is uh, the tipping point, the exemplar that made people rethink what to expect from Sphinx themes. If I was to guess, the two reasons people are switching to make docs: number one is Markdown. So, Chris and Chris, thank you for that. And number two is it just looks a lot better. To be yeah. honest, though, uh, part of the reason Markdown or MK Docs looks really good is because there's one theme that's really good there: MK Docs material. Yeah, the material. Yeah, right. that's all. Yeah, it that's takes. right. Yeah. And I have not, and I've spent a decent amount of time looking as part of research for all of this work that I'm sure. doing. <laughs> oh, is there any other major theme there? And there isn't. There's just one, um, and yeah, pretty much the most of the ecology there just revolves around that. That isn't to say it's a bad thing, 
Certainly yeah. not. And that isn't to say MK Docs is just that team. It's not, right? But a decent amount of the overlap there is, well, the overlap there is huge, is what I would go for. Um, and kudos to Squid Funk, whose name is not coming to my head at the moment um, for the amount of work he's put into that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you and Chris that. are uh, working on a, the oh. new chapter of this idea, right? Which Chris? <laughs> Chris H. I believe the two of you are kind of thinking about what if we didn't have to live with the old contract? Well, I guess the I think what you're referring to is some of the like infrastructure improvements around developing in the Sphinx ecosystem. Is no, I was you're... thinking of there, there's a I thought there was a, a theme itself you were working on that kind of threw out the a, the basic theme, which is the predecessor of all themes. And I thought that you had a repo where there was a new theme you were working on. There is. There's something called almost Sphinx. like an abstract theme or something. Yeah, so the way Sphinx's theme ecosystem works is there's a basic theme. And what that basic theme has is like the JavaScript for Sphinx's search and uh, all kinds of like fundamental things for Sphinx and a very, very, very bare bones uh, HTML structure, essentially. There's, I don't think any CSS even, right? So it's just a very bare bones page to just serve as a basic skeleton for you to build upon, right? Uh, and I think through the work that Chris Chris and I have been doing on themes and among, there's more people and uh, that sort of the name escapes me at the moment. Um, and one of the things we found out was, oh, there's like a lot of common work across these themes mm -hmm. that we put into a layer on top of that and build those things there so that it reduces the amount of duplicated work. It still gives us sort of the bits of flexibility that we want in the individual teams to make opinionated choices, design choices, and whatnot. But there's a decent chunk of, oh, we all will do the same thing. Like breadcrumbs have this HTML structure. Uh, like that will, doing things like that will, will reduce the amount of duplicated effort. And, lower the barrier for entry, essentially, into writing things, which is sort of what I'm personally motivated in at the moment, having written one, uh, is like, oh, this tingles my, uh, the right sort of brain areas, because I, as I've mentioned, I'm a maintainer on PIP. Uh, developer workflows are a thing that I happen to be interested in, uh, and I would say have a decent amount of experience dealing with. So I was like, hey, this looks like a great place to put in a bunch of my JavaScript, HTML, web tech uh, experience combined with a bunch of Python packaging and user workflows around that and sort of put in energy there. So that led to Sphinx Team Builder, which is Fantastic. like... Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's been excellent. I think it's kind of bring, just bringing in that, maybe what Sphinx has lacked in the past is that kind of expertise in, um, in, in web design, really. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, um, excellent people working, as you say, within within Sphinx and, and DocuTils and things on, on the kind of back end and how all that works and all the Python code. Um, and possibly there's been less so in the past of going, right, let's actually make all this good work, um, actually show it off and, and have these just lovely themes that actually show what you can do with it. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it was super fascinating for me because sort of when I jumped in, I was like, oh, recreationally, right? Uh, and to be honest, my motivation jumping into the Sphinx ecosystem was precisely this of like, <laughs> I want it to look better. Yeah. Like, it doesn't yeah. look good. I would like it to look better. And funnily enough, none of this would have happened if Pip hadn't gotten a grant uh, where we had a bunch of computer experience experts sit with us and our users and sort of have that channel of feedback through them as well as their expertise and just having them state multiple times it's like, hey, Pip's documentation's not that great to sort of navigate and stuff. Like there's content, they don't know how to get there. And sort of in those conversations, I was like, 
Yeah, I don't like this side. Now that you've made me look at it a bunch of times. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me, put, let me put something on the screen for you all just to put side by side here. And just put, think about this. And um, you all can pull this up really easily who are listening. Uh, just think about this from the perspective of someone who's choosing a programming language or, or new to programming and deciding, is Python the space for me? You know, if on, on one hand... <laughs> <laughs> we've got, you know, just the, the docs.python.org and the other, you know, something like Tailwind where you look at it and it's just like, it just feels, you mm -hmm. know, so fresh mm -hmm. and, and welcoming. Whereas the other, it's, this is not to take away from the hard and important work of writing the documentation, but the, the way it feels when you land there, I think, is in desperate need. Yeah, but Michael, have you seen what it looks like in a man page? <laughs> I know. It probably is looking the same, <laughs> right? Those three <laughs> man pager users are really happy about this. <laughs> Pretty close. Uh, and that isn't to say those users aren't important, to be clear. Ah. Right? Is that, I mean, it's kind of like moving from MySpace to uh, Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. And I, like I said, I'm not bashing on it. I'm just saying this is the face that the that part of Python is presenting to the world to say, we want you here. Come be with us. Right. And And, and there's a different face that other places are putting on that I think yeah. Um, yeah, probably will appeal a lot more to people who don't know better that you know, they're getting to Brighton JavaScript. And this is really an aspect that I would sort of think, I would like to put my energy into this and make these improvements. And I'm, I'm by far not the only one. There's, yeah. in fact, now a documentation working group being formed uh, in the CPython core develop, like CPython development community, the folks who develop the language uh, around improving this. Um, and there's like a public issue tracker that hopefully going to sort of start ramping up soon because I would like to be involved with that. And I'm aware that Paul is as well. Uh, and yeah, I, there's, this is by no means news to the folks involved. Um, they're aware of this. And I think the first issue itself in the sort of docs community issue tracker that they have is moving to a more modern documentation theme. Um, it's just, uh, uh, as it turns out, there aren't many in Sphinx. Uh, uh, so that's sort of been another thing I've picked up and gone. Yeah. So maybe one more shout out to the Sphinx theme builder that you put together, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, Sphinx theme builder comes in nicely into this. So uh, there's a bunch of Sphinx themes today, right? There's Furo, there's Sphinx book theme, there's PyData Sphinx theme, there's Alabaster, there's, there's a bazillion of those. The first four, uh, three that I mentioned, right, are the folks on this discussion are involved with those. And one of the things that came out of having worked on all of these was it would be nicer to simplify these workflows a bit, make the interaction with JavaScript easier, reduce the amount of bootstrapping required and stuff like that. Um, and that essentially ended up in Sphinx Team Builder, where it sort of streamlines the JavaScript and Python build processes and sort of makes the development workflow easier. Uh, yeah, even comes with a development server that does like refresh the browser on, on change, right? Yes, and I think that's also really nice to have in Sphinx documentation authoring as well. And Paul sort of mentioned this earlier of like me taking up maintainership of too many things. Because I went, I like this. And the, the repository had maintainers needed on it. So I just went and opened an issue and said, hi, add me. And I'm now basically a de facto maintainer on like live reload as well as Sphinx auto build, which is, nice. hi, if you don't use Sphinx auto build and write a lot of Sphinx docs, start using it because it's great, I think. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, I love those auto reload aspects. Yeah. All right, you guys, we are just about out of time. Maybe I'll open it up for if anyone else wants to just give a shout out to something or, or mention something while we're all here together. What have we not covered that we, we need to quickly talk about? Hmm. I mean, the, the main thing that I would just say is to reiterate that I think that what a lot of these like the theme conversations and improving developer 
workflows around the Sphinx ecosystem. One of the reasons that they're so successful is because I think that there is a lot of low hanging fruit in the Sphinx ecosystem to basically like signal boost all of this work that's been done over the last you know 14 years in DocuTales and Sphinx and building this documentation engine and this whole community of people writing extensions for it. In a lot of ways, I think that there's a lot of potential energy there that hasn't been unlocked yet, in part because of some of the things around developer friction or, or themes that don't look kind of like modern and nice and web developy. And I think that there's still a lot more low hanging fruit that can be accomplished with, for example, improving documentation about Sphinx itself or the extensions or, or whatever. And so I think that all of the success of these projects is largely possible only because they're kind of piggybacking on top of this really well established community where a lot of work has already been done and, and a lot of kudos go out to, to that broader community. For, for sure. Uh, and one other thing that I'm sort of hoping to see coming out of this is as sort of these efforts around making it easier to present your theme nicer, making it easier to write your docs and all of these happen, the general quality of the documentation in the Python ecosystem improves. Because when you have something that looks nicer, that is easier to write, that's all of that, it also results in a better quality of documentation where because you're able to go, oh, actually, I can see the structure of my site more clearly. I think I would like to restructure it slightly to make it clearer what the flow is. And uh, oh, I'm missing like this bit of content in this section, but I have it there. Or maybe I should just add it. In. And when these things become more obvious to you, um, through uh, either clearer markup or clearer site design or whatever, uh, it will lead to better documentation. And also, you'll have more people who'd be willing to write those. Because uh, <laughs> right. it won't be like, uh, why am I writing this? Uh, yeah. So yeah. yeah, and also okay. moving away from Sphinx just being seen as a, a developer documentation tool into what Jubilee's book is trying to do, make it available for, for scientists and things to go, oh, wait a minute, I can use this re relatively easily and I can, can share my work or I can write tutorials on science or share my research and things like stuff like that. And, and that part's really interesting to me. And it's why I did the course with Michael on static websites, not static documentation is to think bigger than just docs. Uh, I have an interest in knowledge bases. I'm a developer advocate. We create artifacts that are rich and interconnected and richly linked. Sound like something? No, Sphinx it. has inside of it this engine. Sphinx and DocuTils has this engine inside, which nothing else has. The very first contact you have with the mist in the course that I did is just the humble link. But yeah. when you do it in mist, it will tell you if the thing on the other side isn't there. It'll extract the title and inline it on your side. That is magic to all these other systems. And it's knowledge-based kinds of things that are valuable. And I think that we could tell the story of Sphinx in a bigger way beyond documentation and start doing all of the things that people on technical teams want to do for storytelling. I... I I feel like I want to interject and mention that, hey, you know Sphinx can do blogs? <laughs> yes, there's the A blog extension, yeah. Yep, and right Chris, or Chris H, at least, uh, has his blog on yeah, that's right. his, like, his personal website, as far as I'm aware. When you look inside the code of A blog, which I've followed for years, it shows you tapping into the equivalent of front matter and walking through all the doc trees and looking for structure and doing back refer back references people don't expect to be able to do that in markdown it's 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 a document database that's what you should think of sphinx as and i think there's a lot there of like unlocking like i really do want to reiterate what chris said of like there's a huge body of excellent work that has been done over, over more than a decade mm -hmm. uh, of well and I mentioned older than me, it's like four years younger or something like that. Uh, <laughs> I'm four years older than it. Okay, whatever. I was wrong there. But, but yeah, there's this huge body of work there. And 
there's just it sort of needs the little touch of hey paint uh get it to like look like it's it, it belongs in the sort of modern web yeah. right like, but it also needed mist it needed mist to come along and express that power in a human oriented way and there are so many yeah. things in mist that are mind blowing people haven't scratched the surface with mist yet I actually, to that point, one other quick plug that I would give is, I know we've been talking about Sphinx in this conversation, but um, to reiterate, I think that the goal of MIST is to be a, a tool or implementation agnostic specification for Markdown. And I think that there is a lot of exciting possibilities if we can sort of find the right standards to to apply at the mist you know directives level or roles level or whatever right. and to see if you could get a flavor of markdown that is flexible enough that it could be reused across like a few different kinds of applications Very maybe some that are pure web page maybe some that are full blown documentation maybe pandoc you know whatever and so i invite people who if they can think of use cases or tools that they're working on or ecosystems that they're working in that would benefit from something like and a sort of tool agnostic flavor of Markdown that has natural block and inline level extension points, um, then reach out and we would love to chat because I think it would be really cool to see MIST being applied in other kinds of contexts as well. Yeah, it would just help it grow, get stronger. Yeah, and I guess on a similar sort of call to action -y sense, uh, I think if there's anyone around in the listening, uh, who has sort of JavaScript and web design chops and sort of finds all of this interesting and wants to sort of contribute to making Sphinx look prettier, like reach out, like do honestly any of us uh, on this call. And yeah, we, we'd really like to have more people on board, uh, not least because it's good to have fun collaborators to collaborate with as Chris and Chris have been, uh, but also because I think the ecosystem could use a bunch. Uh, I think Sphinx itself and even Docutals, like the maintainership story on those and the work that those maintainers do is, uh, well, the maintainership story is, let's leave it at interesting. And the work that those maintainers do is really amazing for the amount of resources that they have. So yeah, fantastic. Good call to action. Let's leave it there. Let me ask you all one of the two final questions I typically ask before we get out of here. <laughs> Reggie, I'll start with you. Uh, if you're going to write some Python code, what editor are you using these days? I am using Visual Studio Code. Okay. Uh, used to use Sublime Text, uh, but I've sort of switched over. Yeah, I feel like that's the natural transition for Sublime users. That seems to be yeah. what we're well, <laughs> But it is. Well, I, I'm wondering which one you might be using. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love PyCharm. The best, well. baby, the best. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right on. Chris, see you well. I'm mainly Visual Studio Code, I'm afraid. <laughs> right. Is there, uh, I suspect, probably some notebooks in there as well? Uh, sorry, what you said? Some, there's probably some notebooks in there as well, like some Jupyter. Uh, it, it's partly Jupyter Lab, but uh, yeah. mainly Visual Studio Code. And there's right. also a MIST extension okay. uh, for Visual Studio Code. And we're working on the extension for uh, Jupyter Lab as well. Oh, uh, fantastic. All right, cool. Chris, H? I kind of split 50 50 VS Code and Jupyter Lab. Basically, if I'm doing development, software development, then I do VS Code. And if I do data exploration, interactive computing, that kind of workflow, right, I use the Jupyter Lab. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right on. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. It's been really fun. And thank you for all the hard work on bringing all this stuff up to 2020. Wait, wait. you have two questions. You only I have do. One. I know. All right. Really quick then. Notable PyPI package. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> want to take too much of your time. Okay. I guess for me, it'll be Pursuit Fiber, PPB. Uh, it's really cool educational game engine that's way better than what I had when I got started with Python for gaming. So. Yeah, I just finished doing the Python Bytes podcast with Brian before we started this one. And um, ESA, the European Space Agency, just put two Raspberry Pis on the uh, International Space Station for kids 
and students to program against. I'm like, that's way better than the turtle I got to drive around when I was in school. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul, really quick, what's a package or a library you want to just give a quick shout out to? I have a fascination with dependency injection in a human uh, oriented way, antidote. Antidote. Okay, very interesting. That's new to me. Chris S. Got a library you want to give a quick shout out to? So was that Chris S? <laughs> yes, it was Chris S. <laughs> it was. Uh, okay. um, I, uh, Pipex. I uh, oh, hadn't yeah. used it actually much until recently. And uh, yeah, I, I love it. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I I'm all for that. You know, people um, talk about how it's hard to distribute Python applications and little utilities by packaging them up because, well, you got to download the scripts and then set up the environment. That is the homebrew of the Python world. If you want something, I can go to the terminal and just type that, a command and it runs. Well, if you pipx install it, it's going to just be there and it's fantastic. I love it. People should use it more for that that use case. Yeah, yeah, it's been excellent. Uh, and uh, also with all the work that's been going on in pip, uh, flip for packaging. All it's right, right on. Day. Chris H. Um, I feel like in the name of... Uh, improving UI, UX, and window dressing on uh, technology that some people think is outdated. I would shout out to Rich, uh, oh, yeah. the sort of like UI components, visualizations, whatever. I would love to find a way to get Rich into Jupyterbook or even Sphinx or something like that, because I think it, it makes for a really nice user experience. The only problem is that the maintainer of Rich is much better at Wordle than I am. And so he's like oh. consistently beating me by two or three tries. <laughs> well, every day. <laughs> Oh, uh, with BIP because this seems relevant. One of the things I've been doing through work as well as personal time is improving error messages in PIP, and Rich has played a decent ah, game. Oh, yeah. So it's pretty likely that in the coming release or two, you'll see better error messages, partly thanks to Will's work on Rich. Yeah, absolutely. He's got the whole trace back enhancements and everything. All right. Thank you all for being here. It's been great. I'll chat with you later. <laughs>